Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today's the second Sunday in Advent, uh, and we're going to use, we've been using this Advent wreath uh, as a guide for us, right, to uh, help us in our preparations for Christmas, right? So last week we, uh, we started with this idea of this preparation helps us see that uh, it's not about the gifts, it's not about the decorations, as nice as those things are. It's not even as important as family is. It's, it's not even about family, okay? That, that Christmas is about Jesus. It's about the fact that God came down to us, he came to earth, that, the, that Jesus the Son came to save us, and so our focus is rightly placed upon him. And so last week we had our first candle lit, and that's the hope candle. We have hope in this sinful, broken world because of what Jesus has done, because he came to us. God taking on human flesh, living life among us, living and being tempted and, and doing so much for us, dying and rising again because of all that Jesus has done, we have hope, plain and simple. Without Jesus, without all that we have of what he has done, we are hopeless people, especially when it comes to eternal life. And so today, the next topic flows nicely from that. And I, and I want to ask you, what in the world, what would motivate God to do such an incredible thing? Okay, what would motivate him to take on human flesh, to live, suffer, and die a horrible death for us? And consider the context that this is in when we ask this question. We're talking about the God of all creation, Okay, and I don't mean just our little fancy blue rock with all the water on it that's hurtling through space, not just this place, but every bit of creation, right? You look up in the sky at night um, and, you see, and you see stars and there are literally billions and billions of stars in the sky and the creator of all of that came down in the flesh to die for us. Scripture said he made us special, right? He, he made the sun, moon, the stars, and all that. As he spoke, it simply came to be. So God said in the, in the midst of the nothingness at first, he said, let there be light, and it was. Let there be, and he mentioned trees and plants and, and animals and uh, the fish, the birds, whatever. He said, let there be, and it was, except for us. It says he took special care and he took the clay, the, the dust, and he formed us, formed Adam specifically from that. And we get the specifics then from Eve. He was, Eve was created from Adam's rib. And in, and, and in that creation, he breathed into those two his very breath. And we were created. And it says we were created in his image. And that's not to say that we were to look like him, but that we were made righteous and holy. Without sin, as Scripture says, we were made very good. And that good creation was tempted. Satan is in the garden, and he, he cast doubt on what God said. Did God really say you should not eat this fruit? He said you will not die. He told us contrary to what God said. He said you will not die. And in that moment, Eve doubted. Adam followed, and all mankind fell. We rebelled against what God had said, and we have been rebelling and doing contrary to his will ever since. Time and time again, Scripture shows us God's people doing what they want to do and not following God's will. And we still, of course, do it to this day, right? We confess as much at the beginning of service every time we gather, that we are by nature sinful and unclean. God desires, for example, that we put all of our hope and trust in him, and yet... We continue to put our hope and trust in all sorts of other things, giving those things, those things that belong only to God. God, God said, I have saved you, and he, he asks that we now live as his beloved children. You heard that word a couple times in the second reading today, beloved. You have been redeemed and saved, he says, for my purposes, that's what he has saved you for, right? People, people ask, why am I here on this earth? Well, people ask it all the time. You have been made for God's purposes, to serve the living God, 
to specifically, as Jesus points out, go make disciples of all nations. At the end of Matthew, he says, go tell other people about me. And he uses people from all walks of life, whether it's from the lowliest uh, stations or positions in our society to the people of the highest position. God uses all of them for his purpose. No matter where they are at, no matter their abilities, he gives them the gifts to carry out what he wants to do. That's the context. These are the people, right, that God has, has made and takes us back to that original question. What would motivate him to, to react the way he did? To save a group of perpetually sinning, often ungrateful sinners like you and I. What in the world would motivate him to do this? And it's quite simple, actually. I hope many of you know it. If you've been seeing some of the theme played out in today already, it's simply this. It's love. God loves you. John 3.16 is the central verse of this, one I hope is very familiar to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God loves you. That's the simple message. That's the simple motivation. It's not, he, he did not save you. He does not act in that loving way towards you because you're here in church or because you're good sometimes or because you've, you've tried. It's not because you're baptized. It's not because you, you received the Lord's Supper. Those are gifts. He's already given those to you. He gives you baptism. He gives you Lord's Supper. He gives you his word because he loves you. It's not something that you have, can earn. You don't earn baptism. You don't earn the Lord's Supper. These are gifts God freely gives to you out of the love he has for you. And that is why. That is why. It's the simple reason of why Jesus has gone to the cross. Scripture tells us that while we were still sinners, he chose to do this. He didn't choose to save us because he saw good effort. He said, I know you tried, but, well, you just fell up a little short. He knew how fallen and broken and messed up we were. And he says, I have to save them. Because I love them. And that's, I, I hope for, for everybody here, I hope that's nothing new. I hope you've heard that here and maybe sometimes you go, oh, here we go again. We know that for ourselves, but I see all too often that we forget to, to know that this is true for other people. We come here glad to hear that grace and forgiveness, and then we're kind of like that ungrateful servant that we, we, we've read about that, that goes out and who's, that guy has received all the mercy from the king, right? He had that huge debt, and then he goes out, and that person that is sinning a little, or that person that rather is, owes him just a little bit, he treats horribly. We judge people, we judge people for how they act, and we treat them as if, well, you got to get a little bit better. you got to get your act together before you really should come to church. Or, well, I'm not going to invite that person. I'm not going to interact because, well, uh, man, they're not really the churchy kind of person, pastor. Right? Or we talk to ourselves about that. We talk to one another. I, I've, I've heard people say it, right? Maybe it was even you. Well, that person's not really the church-going type. They're, well, they live kind of rough. Have you heard and seen what they do all the time? They live, if we're going to couch it in some churchy terms, they live a life of sin. Well, yeah, okay. Well, who's Jesus interested in? That person's kind of rough, kind of mean, Pastor. I don't know. Yeah, what in the world would God do with a rough and tumbly kind of person? Peter, kind of rough and brash. God is interested in sinners. He loves them. He went to the cross for them. One of our, as we've gone through this mission and vision process, now it's a couple years going, one of our values that we talk about is that we, at least that we hope to have, that we aspire to, in our case, I think, for this one, is that we love unconditionally. I think there are moments when we as a congregation can love unconditionally, but as we think about some of this sharing the message and maybe who we are inviting or who we react to, that is an aspirational value, to love unconditionally. 
to love people just as they are, and not to say that sin isn't an issue, not to say that Jesus is going to leave them, because we understand that as Jesus encounters people, he doesn't leave them as they are. He does accept you as you are. He's accepted you as the broken sinner. He welcomes you, and he invites you to this place, but here he changes you, and he does invite you to repentance. That's the message that John brought today. That God in his love invites us to repentance, to prepare the way. So as we consider this, this Christmas season, for example, as we want to approach Jesus and worship come Christmas Day and celebrate his coming, he has come to save us. He has died so that you would have life and he invites you to turn away from the sin that is in your life. So he, he, he accepts us and he, we want to invite everybody, but we don't get left on changed by Jesus. That interaction with Jesus transforms us and he's given us life. And so my, my invitation is, my challenge to you is this Christmas season, let's begin loving people the way Jesus has. Not based on what they can do for him or for us rather, not based on how they treat us, but based simply on our love for them, which is a reflection of the love that Jesus has had for us. Remember that verse, right? What did I, we said that he, while we were still sinners, he died. What an amazing thing if we could interact with people and treat them with the love, care, and respect that Jesus does, even when there are people we may not normally have associated with. And all for the sake of the love of Jesus, that they would know that love, that they would be transformed by that amazing love of his. May the love that Jesus has filled you with fill your hearts with a love for your neighbor in all that you say and do so that others may come to know that same amazing grace found in him. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen.